Welcome everyone. This is the Torah in Jewish, Christian, and Islamic interpretation. This class with, the, with Dr. Hanan Gafni um, is on the topic of no sooner had the Bible as we know it been canonized than its inter interpretation became the subject of fierce debate between Jews and the nascent Christian church. Centuries later, with the arrival on the scene of Islam, the battle still raged, and now all three major monotheistic religions took part in the polemics. In this course, we will discuss those diverse conceptions of, of Bible meaning. In addition, we will explore the pivotal role that these early disputes played in the evolution of modern interpretal approaches to biblical texts. This class will be taking place with Dr. Gaffney. With that, Dr. Gaffney, I'm going to hand things over to you. Okay, thank you so much. So I'll do a very, very brief review, as usual, over what we've done so far, and then we'll uh, uh, make some progress. So I'm sharing my screen. Just a second. Okay. Okay, so as uh, Kyla was just describing, the theme of this course is, uh, the, attempt, the goal of this course is to compare the different uh, modes of interpretation that were common in the Jewish, Christian, and Islamic world, and also to discuss briefly the different uh, debates that took place between all these uh, different modes of interpretation. So far, in the first part of the course, we uh, devoted our attention to uh, two of those three parties. We spoke about the Jewish uh, way of reading the, the Torah, and we focused mainly on the rabbinical way of reading the Torah, essentially the drash. We said that the rabbinic way of reading the text was more literal in the sense that stories in the Bible were perceived as historical events, and nothing about prophecies about the future. Also, when we spoke about the, when rabbis interpret the laws, they take them as something literal rather than something symbolic. So that was uh, uh, the Jewish way, the prevailing Jewish way of reading the text. We then moved on and discussed Christian readings of the Torah. And here we were using both uh, New Testament and Church Fathers literature. And we were trying to uh, emphasize that among many Christians, the governing way of reading the text was using allegories. Uh, by using allegories, Christians were able to do two things. On the one hand, they were able to detect or find references or allusions to Christianity in the Bible and particularly in the Torah. So when Christians read stories, they would say it's not just a historical event, but it also bears an additional layer that alludes to the future. It's, in a sense, it's a prophecy that is uh, being uh, uh, expressed through some historical event. So that's on the one hand, but also when it comes to the laws, the Christians were able to say that the laws are not really something that needs to be taken or practiced in the literal sense, but rather only a symbolic uh, presentation of some idea. So this was the Christian way of reading the text. And then we spoke in a previous session about the Jewish Christian debates. We started from the ancient period and then we moved on to the medieval uh, period and we discussed the ways that Jews were trying to uh, establish their literal way of reading the text, whereas Christians were trying to, to uh, prove or to, uh, ex to defend their way of reading the text as allegories. Today, we'll introduce our third party and this will take us, for the, in a sense, for the next two sessions, we'll talk about the Islamic ways of understanding of reading the Torah or the Bible in general. So we'll say a few words of introduction, but most of the class today will be devoted to uh, all sorts of uh, ex uh, uh, examples or demonstrations of this uh, idea. Uh, so again, today we're dealing with the Islamic readings of the Torah. And uh, I'll say just a few words of introduction. Uh, today, we're going to focus our attention mainly on the Quran and how the Quran uh, reads or interprets stories in the Torah. And in the next class, in the next session, we'll have a discussion on later medieval Islamic scholars and we'll discuss how they uh, attempted to understand or to read stories in the Torah. But today, again, we're starting with the earlier phase Way, the way that the Quran interprets uh, the stories of the Torah. So in order for us to start, I just want to say a few words about the Quran and about its role as an interpreter of the Torah. So as you all know, the Quran is a collection of uh, prophecies that uh, Muhammad experiences through uh, Malach, angel Gabriel, and it's recorded in uh, 
in a number, a series of chapters, each chapter is, each chapter is called a surah, or a chapter, and the surahs are divided into verses. Uh, many of, although the Quran discusses many things that are central to Islam, but the first thing that we need to emphasize, the Quran echoes many, many biblical laws and stories. In other words, many laws that we find in the Bible will also repeat themselves in one way or another in the Quran. The same is true for stories, events, or the narrative part of the Torah or of later books in the Bible also appears again in the Quran. So that many figures that we're familiar with from the Bible, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and so on, will also appear in the Quran, Ibrahim, Isachak, Yaakov, and so on. So that's the first thing that we need to emphasize. And that's why it's relevant for us to use the Quran also as a source of interpretation. However, uh, there are many, many differences between the ways that the stories are being told or the laws that are being presented in the Bible in comparison to the way they appear in the Quran. So although we're talking about the same stories, the same figures, and we're talking about laws that are certainly uh, connected, but nevertheless, we have very, very many differences or gaps between the way that stories are being told in the Quran and the way that they're being told in the Bible. And in that sense, we can view the Quran as a take or as a, an, as, as a form of interpretation or understanding of the stories uh, in the Bible. Uh, what, we, what becomes a very compli a complicated, the, the, the difficulty in understanding the Quran as an interpreter of the Bible is that we are not really sure in what form or shape was Muhammad introduced to the Bible to begin with. In other words, when, when Muhammad heard, heard the stories of the Bible, did he hear stories the way they appear in our version of the Bible and he's retelling them his own way and everything we see in the Quran that is different than the Bible is actually Muhammad's understanding of the text or alternatively, in many cases it seems that Muhammad from the very start was introduced to the Bible with accompanying uh, traditions of interpretation, sometimes Jewish interpretation, sometimes Christian interpretations. Yeah. So it's not really so easy to determine what was Muhammad's role or impact on the understanding of the Bible. What was his role? What was his contribution to the understanding of the text? And what was just traditions that he inherited from, uh, from Jews or from Christians before his time? Our uh, class today will try to uh, discuss these types of uh, presentations of stories in the Bible that also appear in the Quran and try to classify them into different groups and different ways that stories that appear in the Bible might appear later on in the Quran. So for that purpose, I wanted to classify or discuss uh, a few modes or a few types of presentations uh, of stories in the, of the Bible that appear in the Quran. As you see here, we can discuss various patterns in which the Quran retells or uh, presents stories in the Bible. And I'm gonna introduce us to four types of presentations and what we'll do in the rest of the class is demonstrate that. So in some cases, you will find the story that we know from the Bible appear again in the Quran with all sorts of adoptions of Jewish or Christian post-biblical interpretations. So the story will appear in the Quran in a different way than it, than it appears in the Bible. And scholars would assume that it's just because the Quran received this tradition, this biblical tradition with accompanying traditions that developed later on in the post-biblical period, either by Jews or by Christians. So we can't immediately jump to conclusions that whatever, whatever is different than the Quran in comparison to the Bible is Muhammad's own uh, ideas, or it's about Islam, something about Islam, it could very often be just an adoption of a Jewish or Christian traditions. So that's one reason or one explanation for the type of, uh, for differences between these two records. In other cases, and here we're already moving more towards the Islamic contribution. In some cases, you can tell, you can talk about, I would say, an anachronistic retelling of the Bible inspired by Islamic views. So Muslim might read the story of the Bible, but think about it in light of later events that are central in Muhammad's own biography, Muhammad's own life. So they read the same stories, just like when we tell stories in the Bible, in the in shul, in the synagogue, and we, we tell the story, but we're also telling it in a way that is uh, partially anachronistic due to our own experiences. So Muhammad might have been doing the same thing. He's retelling stories 
in a way that relates to his own life or his own experiences and challenges. So that's the second type of uh, reading that we would encounter in the Quran. Sometimes we're moving a step even uh, further. In some cases, it's clear that it's not just an adoption of a Jewish tradition or even not an anachronistic retelling of the story of the Bible, but it's actually a clear deviation from the Jewish or Christian version of the Bible. The story is being told in a drastically different manner due to or as a result of all sorts of Islamic uh, concerns or agendas. And this is already something that we can already more uh, describe as an Islamic impact or, or uh, influencing the way that the Bible was being uh, told, the stories of the Bible are being told, and not just an adoption of a Jewish tradition, not even just giving it a little bit of an Islamic flavor, but actually changing the facts, changing the details in a way that would make it more uh, meaningful or important or that suits the ideas of Islam. Finally, in some cases, we might, uh, we might discuss cases or examples where it's unclear. It seems like the Quran is telling a story that appears in the Bible with all sorts of unclear uh, elements that have nothing to do with Islam, just flaws in the stories, problems in the description. Is that a matter of confusion, lack of understanding of the original story? So these are more problematic and also sensitive uh, types of uh, gaps between the Bible and the Quran. And at the end of class, we'll try to demonstrate that as well. So what we need to do now is just explore all these types or all these various patterns using all sorts of stories from the Bible. And what we will do, we'll follow the same pattern. We'll read a passage from the Torah. We'll tell the story. We'll read the way that the same story appears in the Quran. We'll try to point out what are the big gaps or what are the major striking differences between the way the story is being told in the Bible in comparison to the way it's being told in the Quran and try to come up with the explanation why. Where did the Quran uh, come up with all of its additions? Is it a Jewish tradition, anachronistic retelling, deviation, or confusion? Okay, so we're starting. I hope you're ready. And I'm going to need your help, all of you, whoever is here. If you can help me with the reading, that would be great. Kailan, especially thinking about you. <laughs> uh, okay, before we go on, I just want to tell you these are two books, one in Hebrew and one in English, that have uh, contributed a lot in this field. Uh, one of them is by Abraham Geiger, the founder of liberal Judaism, of Reform Judaism. He wrote his dissertation in German, and that was about the, he, the question he discusses is what did Muhammad uh, adopt or learn from, uh, from Ju uh, Judaism. In a sense, what did he, uh, what elements from the stories of the Bible and their later rabbinic interpretations were incorporated as part of the Quran. So that was Abraham Geiger's book already in the middle of the 19th century. And in the 20th century, there are numerous other compositions. This is the one that you see on the left is a book that would appeared about 10 years ago, also discusses the ways that stories make their way from the Mikra, from the Bible, all the way through the Midrash and later to the Quran. Okay, so now we're starting with example number one. Uh, the first example comes from the story of Cain and Abel. So we're going to read the story very, very briefly, or at least discuss the story very briefly. And what I want you to pay attention, even though you're more familiar, I gather, with the Hebrew uh, reading of this, with the Hebrew version of this text as it appears in the Hebrew Bible, I want us to pay attention to all the details because we will see a few important striking differences when we can read it also in the Quran. So I'm going to read the story in the Bible and then uh, one of you will read the version in the Quran. Okay, so keep pay attention. I'm not going to read the whole story, but pay attention to the part that we see here. So it starts as follows. Now Adam knew his, uh, Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, you will, be, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin crouching at the door, its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. 
Cain spoke Abel to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So I'm sure you're familiar with that story. And now we will be uh, introduced to the parallel ver version of this story in the Quran. When I read the Quran for the first time, I was surprised uh, to discover the extent of which stories that have come up in the Bible also appear in the Quran. This is not a rare exception. It's a nice portion of the Quran. Stories that repeat, uh, stories that we're familiar with from the Bible that appear in the Quran. Kyla, you want to read the version in the Quran? Sure. Okay. So pay attention to all the details and then we'll discuss what are the striking differences between the story here and the story in the Bible? Okay. Recite to them the truth of the story of the two sons of Adam. Behold, they each presented a sacrifice for Allah. It was accepted from one, but not from the other. Said the latter, be sure I will slay thee. Surely, said the former, doth accept of the sacrifice of those who are righteous. If thou dost stretch thy hand against me to slay me, it is not for me to stretch my hand against thee to slay thee. For I do fear Allah, the, the cherisher of the worlds. For me, I intend to let thee draw on thyself my sin as well as thine. For thou wilt be among the companions of the fire, and that is the reward of those who do wrong. The soul of the other led him to the murder of his brother. He murdered him and became one of the lost ones. Then Allah said to Raven, who scratched the ground, to show him how to hide the shame of his brother. Woe is me, he said. Was I not even able to be as this raven and so hide the shame of my brother? Then he came, became full of regrets. On that account, we ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Then although there came to be them our apostles with clear signs, yet even after that, many of them continued to commit excesses in the land. Okay, thank you so much. And we're going to have to discuss now the, the striking differences that appear or that uh, emerge when you compare these two versions. So I think uh, we don't have time to get into all the details. This deserves an entire class. But uh, I, I think we can talk about, we can go by order. And I think that it's important to compare not just what appears in the Quranic version that does not appear in the Bible, but also what doesn't appear here, because that also tells us something. Uh, so I would start by saying that in the Quran, what's missing, the first thing that is missing is already in the presentation of these two brothers. These two brothers in the Quran don't have names. And we also don't know anything about their occupation. And we also don't know what type of sacrifice each one of them brought. This is a very important statement by the Quran. The Quran is, in a sense, telling us, don't look in that direction. That's not the essence of the story. The point of the story is not why God took one's uh, sacrifice over the other. It's not a telling us anything about the, the type of, uh, of uh, occupation that each one adopts. That's not the story. It also has nothing to do with the, who was the firstborn, who was the second son. All that is not important for the Quran. And that's already a striking uh, element in the Quran that gives us leaves a lot of room for thought. We move on in the story. And then the story here is also very different in the Bible in, in terms of the type of dialogues that are taking place. In the Torah, what we have is we have a brief discussion between God and Cain. God is speaking to Cain and is encouraging him to improve his ways. But on the other hand, Cain and Abel are not really managing to talk. The Pasuk says, It doesn't tell us what their conversation was about. And some scholars actually point out that maybe part of the problem is that they were not able to express themselves in words. And that's why it, they... they uh, it leads them to uh, uh, murder. In the Quran, it's reversed. On the one hand, Cain does speak to Abel, and as a matter of fact, he even war war threatens him that he's about to kill him, but that God does not communicate with another one of the two. But I want to refer to the last part of the story. In the last part of the story, there are two uh, uh, very clear additions in the story of the Quran that do not appear in, the, in our version, in the Jewish version of the Bible. In verse 31, you see that it tells us a story about a raven. Allah sends a raven, scratches the ground in order to show Cain that he has to bury uh, his brother, to hide the shame of his brother. And that's what he does. So through, uh, he sees the raven digging and then it makes him clear. It, it, it becomes evident to him that he also needs to bury uh, his brother. And finally, on the, uh, at the end, 
we also have the moral or the ethical under, uh, outcome of this story. On that account, we ordain, ordain the children of Israel. If a person kills one person, it's as if he committed or as if he uh, he's responsible for, for murder or spreading mischief in the land. If you, if you uh, kill one person, it's as if you kill the entire world. Or alternatively, if you save one soul, it's as if you save the entire world. These two additions do not appear in the biblical account that we have in the Torah. And the question that comes up immediately is, so where did that come from? Before, and as I was warning you before, before coming into conclusion and immediately assuming, oh, this is Muhammad's own ideas or Muhammad's own uh, creative thinking about the story, we always need to explore and check out whether these traditions appear already in earlier uh, traditions, both Jewish or Christian. Perhaps it's just an adoption, an Islamic adoption of an existing tradition that it was out there before Muhammad's time. And in this particular case, this, in, is, this is indeed the story. Uh, in both uh, Midrash and the Mishnah, we find a lot of these elements. And I'm talking about texts that come before the time of Muhammad. So it's clear that Muhammad heard the story with these additional elaborations of the story. In the Midrash, you see on the passage on the left, uh, a version that resembles what we find in, in the Quran. After Abel was slain, he was lying in the field and his blood, his blood was splattered over sticks and stones. Uh, I'm skipping a little bit. Adam and his mate came and sat by the corpse, weeping and mourning for him, but they did not know what to do with Abel's body. A raven whose companion had just died said, I will teach Adam what to do. The raven took his dead companion, dug up, the earth before the eyes of Adam and his mate and buried, and buried him in it. Adam said, will we not, will we do the same? We will do the same as the raven. So it's clear when you see this tradition, it's not precisely the same way that it appears in the Quran. It's not Cain that is being, uh, that is burying Abel, but rather it's Adam and his mate. But still the, the comparison or the resemblance is so clear. It's obvious that this raven tradition teaching them that a person needs to be buried after being killed is not something that Muhammad came up on his own. It's something that he probably inherited for, from some earlier tradition that existed before his time. In the same manner, and this is really a fascinating example, the moral message of this story that appears in the Quran that if you kill a person, it's as if you kill the entire world, or if you save a soul, it's as if you save the entire world. This is actually a text that is almost word for word found in the Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah in Masechet Sanhedrin talks about the ways that people used to threat witnesses before they testify that they shouldn't lie and lead to somebody's, uh, uh, for some innocent soul, uh, death. And uh, the Mishnah says the way that you used to threaten the witnesses is by telling them the story of Cain and Abel. It says, uh, this is what we would tell the witnesses, for we find concerning Cain who killed his brother, it is written, the bloods of your brother's cry it does not say your brother's blood, but bloods in plural, his blood and the bloods of his offsprings. And later on, it says, therefore, man who created, there, that's why man is created singly to teach us that whoever destroys what a single soul of Israel, scripture is accounts as if he destroyed the full world. And whoever saves one soul of Israel, scripture accounts as if he had saved a full world. Again, it's clear that in this case, Muhammad, or the Quran didn't come up with this tradition but just inherited this from a Jewish existing uh, tradition in the Mishnah. When you read it in this context, you also understand how this conclusion, conclusion came up because in the Quran, it's not really clear how did they come to the conclusion from the story that if you save one soul, it's as if you save the entire world or if you kill a person, it's as if you kill the entire world. But in the Mishnah, it's, being, it's spelled out. The, the Torah says, Kol dmei achicha, damim, in plural, and that's why Chazal learned that if you kill one soul, it's not just uh, destroying his life, but rather his uh, future or potential descendants. So this is the first example. And what I was trying to demonstrate through this example is that in many cases, the Quran or departs from the way that the story is being told in the Bible, but it's not really due to any Islamic uh, understanding of the story. It's not necessarily connected to any Islamic ideas. It could just be an adoption of an existing Jewish and sometimes also Christian uh, traditions, interpretations of the Bible. But it doesn't end here, because in some cases we can see that it goes a step further. 
And that's what I want to see in the following story. And the following story we'll talk about is the story of Noah. So I'll just read the first uh, few verses of the story of Noah, and we'll immediately jump and try to see how the story is presented in the uh, Quranic version of the, of the same uh, event. So the Bible starts as follows. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just and perfect in his, a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. The earth, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all the flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And then God approaches Noah and says, uh, the end of the flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. This is the beginning of the story of the flood that you're all familiar with. The same story, and in this case, it's not just in one surah, in one chapter, but it actually appears in numerous places in the Quran. The story of the flood repeats with important differences. And this is what I want us to see right now in the text in the 11th surah. It's called the Surah of Hud. Hud is one of, is associated with Noah. So uh, this, we're not starting, we're not reading the entire surah. It's just, we're starting somewhere in the middle. And uh, Muhammad is approaching people of his time, trying to convince them uh, to convert to Islam. And in the flow of his uh, preaching, He's also addressing the story of Noah. And this is what he says. And again, we'll read this passage and I will ask you, what does he add beyond what the Bible says? Tyla, again, you're going to be the Quran guy today. All right. Uh, Just starting, for now. Okay. Starting from the notables? Yeah, we, we sent. Okay. We sent Noah to his people. I am to you a clear warner that you shall worship none but God. I fear for you the agony of a painful day. The notables who disbelieved among his people said, we see, you in, in not, we see in you nothing but a man like us, and we see that only the worst among us have followed you. In fact, we think you are liars. He said, oh, my people, I ask of you no money for it. My reward lies only with God. I do not say to you that I possess the treasures of God, nor do I know the future, nor do I say that I am an angel. They said, oh, no, you have argued with us and argued a great deal. Now bring upon us what you what you threaten us with if you are truthful. Okay, so this is the way the story of the flood begins. And eventually, uh, after their discussion back and forth, it ends by saying that it was revealed to Noah. You're continuing. And it was revealed to Noah, none of your people will believe except those who have already believed. So do not grieve over what they do. And build the ark under our eyes and with our inspiration and do not address me regarding those who did wrong, they are to be drowned. As he was building the ark, whenever some of the people passed by him, they ridiculed him. He said, if you ridicule us, we will ridicule you, just as you ridicule. Okay, so this is the beginning of the story of the flood in the Quran. I want you to be impressed that all these stories also appear in the Quran, that millions and millions of Muslims who read the Quran are also familiar with the same stories that we are uh, familiar with from the Hebrew Bible, from our Bible. And uh, I think when you read this, this, the story goes on and on. I just, I stopped this in the beginning, but uh, even reading these first few verses of the Surah, it's already clear that Noah, there's something different about the description of Noah in the Bible and the way it's described in the Quran. What's the striking difference here? When you read the Bible, do we, does Noah ever speak? Does he say anything? He's very quiet. It just tells us that he was a quiet guy. He was a, a righteous person, right? Uh, and just and perfect in his generation, Sadiq Tamim, and that's it. And then one day God approaches him, tells him, I'm going to bring the flood and just build your ark. In the Quran, we see a very, very long description, a very long, uh, a, a very detailed description of Noah tried to preach to the people of his time. He's trying to tell them, you know, follow God, worship God. And on the other hand, they're telling him in return, they're telling him, you're a liar. He tells them, I'm not claiming to be, I'm not gaining anything by doing this. I'm not making any money. I'm not claiming to be an angel or to have a, 
to be supported by any angel. I'm not claiming that I possess the treasures of God. I'm just an ordinary guy and I'm telling you to repent. And they don't listen to him and they just tell him, just go ahead. They make fun of him and at some point God tells him, ignore them. This whole dialogue between the two parties does not appear in any word in the Hebrew Bible. It does not appear anywhere. So again, we ask ourselves, where did that come from? Why does the Quran add this impressive addition about uh, Noah talking to the people of his time? And then you already learned that before we jump to conclusions, say, oh, it's about Islam, it's something about Islam, we always have to explore that these traditions exist before Muhammad's time. Maybe this idea that Noah is a preacher that approaches the people of his time before bringing the flood is actually something that appeared before Muhammad, before Islam. And this is indeed the case in uh, this example as well. We find in the Midrash uh, a very long description how uh, you see in the, in the Midrash Tanchuma, I'm reading from the second line, for 120 years, the Holy One kept warning of the generation of the flood in the hope that they would resolve uh, to, to repent. When they do not repent, he said to Noah to make the ark. And then Noah starts working on the ark and he has a long conversation with the people of his time. And you can see that here too, they mock him. They mocked and ridiculed him. In the meantime, he was watering the cedars and trying to prepare the ark. And again, they approach him and they ask him, what are you doing? And he's trying to explain what's going on and he's trying to uh, make them repent. And it's only when they do not repent uh, after these ongoing uh, discussion, God tells him, just leave them alone. Leave them alone. And by that point, they can write ready access and uh, uh, go into the ark. So this tradition of Noah being a preacher is actually not entirely an Islamic invention. You also find it in the other texts in the Talmud, a similar tradition that Noah approaches and preaches the people of his time. And it makes sense that Chazal would want to make Noah become a preacher because otherwise, why is he? Uh, why does he deserve to be saved if he doesn't care about anybody else? He wouldn't be worthy of being saved. But I think it was important for Chazal to say that Noah is a perfect person also by caring for others and also that others deserve to die because they did not listen to all his words. But in this case, and that's why I'm, I'm arguing that this example goes beyond the one that we saw before. It's not just an adoption of uh, what Noah is telling is, it's not just an adoption of a Jewish tr existing tradition. Because when you see, when you explain, when you go in, look into the details of what Noah tells the people of his time, you will find something very striking. In many, many other places in the Quran, Muhammad approaches people of his generation trying to convert them to Islam. And we see that Muhammad is actually using precisely the same type of uh, same expressions. He tells us that people did not believe him, thought that he's inventing whatever he's saying. And he's t answering them, telling them, I'm not, I'm not claiming, I'm not attempting to be anything special. I'm just an ordinary guy. The treasures of God, of God are not in my possession. I'm not claiming to be an angel or that angels accompany me. We see the precise same type of dialogue between Muhammad and the people of his time. I'll give you an example. Uh, these are from two other passages in the Quran. Uh, people, and this is not about Noah. This is about Muhammad and his people. Uh, Kyla, you want to read two more passages from sure. the Quran? Okay. From Surah 11, yeah. perhaps you wish to disregard some of what is revealed to you, and you may be stressed because of it, since they say, if only a treasure was sent down to him, or an angel came with him, you are only a warner and God is responsible for all things, or do they say he invented it? Okay, so you see that people were speaking to, Mucha to Muhammad, mocking him by telling him, uh, you don't have any treasures with you, no angels accompany you, or... You're inventing what you're saying. You're a liar. Precise same type of dialogue that took place between Noah and the people of his time. Also in Surah number six, we see, uh, you want to do number six, say. Yeah. Say, I do not say to you that I possess the treasuries of God, nor do I know the future, nor do I say to you that I am an angel. I only follow what is inspired to me. Say, are the blind and seeing alike? Do you not think? So this is the way that God or Gabriel is instructing Muhammad to approach people of his time. 
and tell them, I do not say that uh, I possess the treasures, treasuries of God or that I'm uh, an angel. We see the same formulation appears in the description of Noah speaking to his people and Muhammad speaking to the uh, people of his generation. And I think here, and that's why I said this example takes, up, takes us one step further. True, Muhammad did not make up the idea that Noah was a preacher and that he was preaching to the people of his time. But I think what Muhammad is doing, he's reading it in an anachronistic manner. He wants to color the story of Noah in ways that will resemble his own life experiences. He wants to feel, or the, the Quran is trying to make a point that Muhammad is going through the same story, the same challenges that Noah faced centuries before his time. As a matter of fact, in another place in the Quran, in Surah number four, uh, the Quran itself compares between the two. We have inspired you as we had inspired Noah and the prophets after him. Or in Surah number 22, if they deny you, before them, the people of Noah and Ad and Tamud also denied. So I think here we are already moving a step further. The Quran sometimes flavors or tells the stories of the Bible in a way that will resemble Muhammad's own experiences. So we read the story in a rather anachronistic manner. It makes us feel as if Muhammad is just one more of many who are facing the same challenges of spreading the words of God in the world. And if, not, if Muhammad feels frustrated why he's not successful in converting everybody to Islam, he should know, you know what? Noah had a hard time too. And eventually God saved him. And the people who followed him were saved and not others. So in that way, I think we find here something that goes a step further. It's not just about reading uh, this edition or adopting the Jewish tradition, but it's also an anachronistic telling of the story in a way that will make it more meaningful for Muslims later on. So, so far we've discussed two patterns of the ones that we've, we uh, presented before. An adoption of a Jewish tradition, like in the story of Cain and Abel, or an anachronistic retelling of the story in a way that connects or links between Muhammad's life and biblical figures. I wanna emphasize, this is not what Christians were doing. Muslims are not saying that the story of Noah is about Muhammad, the way that Christians might read a story and say, it's an allegorical description of what will happen later on for Jesus. This story is actually about Jesus. Muslims were not doing that, that, that uh, step. They're not trying to read this as prophecies about Muhammad. It's more of a, an anachronistic telling of a story in a way that would make it more relevant, inspiring, meaningful for Islamic audience. Just like Jews might read the story of the Bible in, in, their, in synagogues in, in Drasha and make the story relevant. So in that sense, we also see this in that way, we can also see it in some Islamic readings of the story. Uh, since we are lacking time, so I'm not gonna get through the, the, entire, the full example, full coming example, but I wanna briefly uh, mention one more without reading all the sources. The story of Abraham and especially Abraham's beginning, the beginning of his career, there's also a fascinating resemblance between the story of the Bible and what we're familiar with and what we're come familiar with in, from the Bible and the way it's also being told in the Quran with uh, dramatic editions. In the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, in the Torah, what we see is that uh, Haran, uh, I'm sorry, that Terach, the father of uh, Abraham, Nachor and Haran, is leaving Ur Kasdim on, on his way to the to the land of Canaan. Eventually they settle somewhere, but they don't make the whole way all the way, they don't make it all the way to Canaan. And uh, towards the end, you see, at some point, the Lord approaches Abraham and tells him, you shouldn't stop where you are, but rather proceed and go all the way to the land of Canaan. This is what we have in the Torah. And when you read it in the Quran, you will have a very, very long description, a long surah in the Quran that tells the story of Abraham's departure of Ur Kastim with a very striking addition. And I'm sure you're familiar with that addition. The Quran tells a long story about how Abraham was making fun of the idols of the people of his hometown. And uh, it reaches a point where Abraham breaks, destroys all the small idols 
and claims or argues that it was the biggest idol there that has done all this damage. And then they're starting to go back and forth speaking about the idols. Abraham is trying to make a point that it's that their uh, uh, idolatry is meaningless and that they should all follow God. In the Quran, Abraham is being thrown to the furnace, but God saves him. And eventually he manages uh, to escape from Ul Qasnim to the land of Canaan. So this story appears in the Quran, and I just want to talk, read you one last uh, verse. It ends by saying, and we saved him and Lot and brought them to the land which we blessed for the peoples. So this is the end of the story, how Abraham moves from Ul Qasdim to the land of Canaan. And again, we see a striking difference. In the Bible, it doesn't say anything about Abraham mocking the idols, Abraham being thrown to the furnace. All of that does not appear in any word in the Bible, but it's elaborated at great length in the Quran. The entire story appears word for word in the Quran. You see, it's a very long description that I'm not even uh, bothering reading with you now. It's just take too much time. And again, we ask, where did the Quran did get, get this story from? Is this Muhammad's own interpretive uh, contribution? Did he make this up? And again, before we jump to conclusions, we need to explore, did this exist in, in, in a Jewish or Christian traditions before Muhammad's time? And here too, the answer is yes. We have a lot of this already appear in earlier Jewish traditions. I'm sure you're familiar with this tradition about Abraham breaking all the idols and Abraham being thrown to the uh, fire. All that we already know from Jewish traditions. It appears, all of this appears at great length in the Midrash. That, again, we're not going to go through. So all this exists already in Chazal, in rabbinic literature. So one might think, oh, so this is again another example of an Islamic adoption of a Jewish tradition, of a Jewish interpretation of the story of Abraham. Side point. So now we need to ask, and why did Jews make up this story? Why did Jews need to tell the story about Abraham breaking the idols and Abraham uh, being thrown to the fire? What was Why, why were uh, the rabbis interested in creating such a legend? And we can come up with all sorts of ideas. For instance, one might argue that Chazal wanted to make a point that Abraham was worth being saved by God or being chosen by God. It wasn't Abraham. It's not that God approached Abraham out of, for no reason and told him and not his brothers, his siblings, to go to the land of Canaan. From Chazal's perspective, from the rabbi's perspective, before God approaches Abraham, before God chose uh, Abraham, it was actually Abraham who chose God, who discovered God. And that's why Abraham was worth being saved. And that's why Abraham uh, was the one who moved to the land of Canaan. And Abraham showed his trust in God by trying to preach or make a point that all the idols are, are meaningless. So this is perhaps one reason why the rabbis might have uh, created this tradition. Back to Islam. So we see the same tradition in the Islamic world. Muslims also tell the same story. We could claim that it's just an adoption of a Jewish tradition. But again, there are those nuances that show that there is some Islamic flavor to the way that, to this story as it's presented in the Quran. One striking example is what I was reading to you at the very last uh, verse in the Quran. In the very, very last, the very uh, two verses of this uh, surah in the Quran, it talks about Abraham that needed to uh, escape, not just to move willingly, but rather to escape from the people of uh, his old hometown in Ukasdim. It says, they had thought to do evil to him, but we made them the worst losers, and we saved him in Lot and brought them to the land which uh, we blessed for the peoples. In the Quran, there, the tradition is a little bit about Abraham and his people escaping from their hometown. And this is already something that scholars would say, it's already something that Muhammad is telling us because it want, he wants us to feel that this is a, he's going through a similar experience. As you all know, uh, Muhammad starts his career in the city of Mecca, but the people in Mecca were not willing to become Muslims uh, as Muhammad was uh, wished. And Muhammad, according to Islamic traditions, had to escape 
from Mecca to Medina, uh, and it was due to the, the angel in the in the Islamic tradition. The angel had to threaten Muhammad uh, that he's about to be killed, and he escapes in the last minute before uh, this uh, this plan uh, took place. And perhaps when Muhammad is telling the story of Abraham, how Abraham was saved by some prophecy and manages to escape from Ul Qasdim to the land of Canaan uh, and uh, managing to sa being saved from all these evil people, Muhammad is trying to tell us the story in rather anachronistic manner in a way that would feel relevant for people of his time. Muhammad will say, I'm going through the same experiences of Abraham. Abraham had to work hard in order to spread the word of God, and so am I. So this is another example of an adoption, but also an anachronistic way of telling a story in the Bible. Uh, the next example, one step further. It's not an adoption of a Jewish tradition. It's not uh, an anachronistic way of telling the story, but rather clear deviation, departure from rabbinic tradition. And here I want to talk about a famous story or two important figures, Yitzchak, Yitzchak, and Ishmael, Ismail, in the Bible and the Quran. In the Hebrew Bible, Ishmael is obviously Abraham's uh, firstborn uh, from Hagar, not from Sarah, from Hagar, but he he's expelled from Abraham's house. True, uh, when Ishmael is expelled from Abraham's house, Abraham blesses him. God blesses him, and also Abraham will eventually bless him. It says, Uli Ishmael Shmaticha, Kine Berachti Oto, Vifreti Oto, Virbeti Oto, Bim Od Meod. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. So we'll talk about these verses in the next session. But the Bible also makes clear, Ve'et Briti Akimet Yitzchak, but my covenant will, I will establish with Isaac. So this is the biblical record. Later on, from after Ishmael departs from the house or leaves the house of Abraham, the story will focus only on Yitzchak and everything else will happen, uh, will focus on Yitzchak and especially the story of the binding. It's the binding of Isaac. Isaac is the son that was uh, bound by Abraham. What about the Quran? In the Quran, the story is very different. In the Quran, Ishmael, Ismail, is not just Abraham's son. He is a prophet. Throughout the Quran, you will see 